If this presidential election is about the economy, stupid, then this should be a slam dunk, a layup, a, a no-brainer. And speaking of no-brainers, Joe Biden, whatever brain he's got is broken. We're going to lay that out for you. Also, Don Lemon versus Elon Musk. And Elon Musk did what, well, he should have done when Don Lemon first called him a couple of months ago about doing a show on X. And how's that defund the police thing working out for you? Well, we'll show you some examples of certain police departments who are just, well, they're just giving up on law enforcement. Why bother after all? All that and a whole lot more. We're brought to you by the Electronic Payments Coalition. I'm Larry O'Connor. Please call me Larry. Because, you know, we're on a first name basis here now. It's it's streaming, it's video podcasting, it's uh, what it is. We're rumbling live right now at noon Eastern time as we do pretty much every day. Thanks for joining us live. And thanks for all the comments that you've been adding to the conversation. They mean a lot to us. We're starting to incorporate them more into the show. And certainly after the fact, we go back and uh, respond whenever you say nice things. When you say lousy things, we, well, none of you have said lousy things, which is also kind of nice. Uh, if you're not watching us live, make sure you share this video that you're seeing right now elsewhere. Like it. Give us a rating if you can, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever, wherever it is you're listening. And if you're watching us right now on the Town Hall media platforms like Town Hall or Hot Air or PJ Media or Red State or Bearing Arms, why don't you take a look at that VIP section? You can have a great commercial free experience at townhall.com. When you're a VIP member, you also get a lot of extra VIP content that uh, the rest of the plebs out there don't get. And you'll be supporting our journalism. The, our journalism, Kurt Schlichter's journalism, Katie Pavlich's, Guy Benson's, uh, Derek Hunter. Those are just some of the columnists. Plus, of course, the whole teams at Red State. Oh, Jennifer Van Lahr and her investigative journalism at Red State. Keep us going there. And if you use the promo code Larry. When you become a member of uh, Town Hall VIP, you'll get a 50% discount. So check that out as well. All right. Uh, President Bo Joe Biden was lying yesterday about the economy. And when he wasn't lying, well, he was just displaying how his brain, which is full of mashed potatoes, just doesn't function anymore. Take a watch. Wages are rising faster than prices. And now we have among the lowest inflation rates of any country in America. And still, we're still fighting to lower it even further. Wow, we did it, everybody. We've got the lowest, uh, we've got the lowest inflation rate in any other country in America. It's amazing. What an achievement. I don't think we've ever done that before. This is historic. The lowest inflation rate of any other country in America. Is that his stutter? Is that his stutter popping up again? It's not your classic stutter, is it? All right. Are we supposed to extend some grace to Joe Biden? You know, because he always extends so much grace to us Republicans and conservatives. He's also he's always so forgiving and understanding and always gives us the benefit of the doubt, doesn't he? Just like he did Robert Bork and Clarence Thomas and Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. And well, don't get me started on on today's Republican Party. Yeah. OK, let's extend some grace. He just misspoke. He meant the lowest inflation rates in the world, right? Uh, if that's the case, if we're extending grace and we're saying he doesn't have a broken brain, and what he meant was we have the lowest inflation rates in the world, then if that's the case, he's just a freaking liar. And his brain just functions fine. He's just a deceitful scumbag. Karine Jean-Pierre tried to repeat the whole, hey, the economy's great, everybody, message yesterday at the press briefing. Inflation is down two thirds and we have the lowest annual core inflation since May 2021. Uh, prices fell over the last year for gas, milk, eggs, chicken, appliances uh, and also used cars. Wages are rising faster than prices over the last year since the pandemic and forecasts broadly expect progress on inflation to continue over uh, the rest of the year. OK, so let's go through this now bit by bit together, because when she spews out a lot of information that's been pre-written and pre-planned and pre-tested in her little pre-conference meeting, and she just spits it at you, you know she's trying to BS you. So let's start here. Inflation is down two-thirds. and we Inflation is down two-thirds from what? Inflation is down two-thirds from the skyrocketing inflation. 
that you had in the first two years of the Biden administration. And by the way, when you say inflation is down two thirds, let's use round numbers. Let's say inflation was 10% in 2021. And now in 2024, it's down two thirds, which means inflation is just, let's say, three and a half points, right? Because that's that's one third of 10. Well, guess what? It's not like prices are now reducing. No, inflation down two thirds, inflation just being three and a half, hypothetically, in this scenario, means the prices are still going up by 33%, right? It stacks on top of itself. So inflation at 10, and then the next year they cut inflation by 50%. That means inflation by five. That means over the course of two years, you've got 15% inflation. And then if it's down two thirds, well, you're adding another four or 5% to the entire thing. It's still stacking up on itself. Prices aren't going down. Prices are continuing to go up. They're just not going up as much drastically as much as they were in the first year of the Biden administration. And all of this inflation is due to their policies, right? So I'm only two seconds into this and I'm already explaining how she's trying to BS you, but that's just the beginning. We have the lowest annual core inflation since May 2021. Since May 2021. Who was president in May 2021? So see, they're bragging about how we now have the lowest inflation since our first year of our presidency. What's that to brag about? And by the way, it's still lower inflation. It's not no inflation. It's not the elimination of inflation. It's not the discontinuation of inflation. Prices are still going up. Hey, guys, prices aren't going up nearly as much as they were the first year of our presidency. When back then they were denying they even had high inflation. Remember? Oh, it's just transitory inflation. This is a blip. This isn't happening. All right. So now we're five seconds in and the BS continues. Uh, prices fell over the last year for gas, milk, eggs, chicken, appliances. Prices fell over the last year. Well, that means they were too high a year ago, right? Again, you always have to listen to what they're doing and what they're comparing it to. What about inflation compared to the Trump presidency? What about prices compared to the Trump presidency during a different economy? All they're doing is comparing that things aren't nearly as bad as they were under the same president, under the same economic principles. And by the way, that's also a lie. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and also used cars. Wages are rising faster than prices over the last year. Since that's a lie. It's the pandemic and forecasts broadly expect progress on inflation to continue over uh, the rest of the year. Yeah, they expect it to continue. And part of that is because, well, they put their fingers on the scale there when it comes to economic projections. Now, do you want to really hear how the economy is doing? Do you want to really hear how inflation is in real terms, in terms of you actually sitting at the end of the month and seeing how much money you've got left, if you have any left, after paying your bills? Here's the truth. All right, let's talk about money. We're back with the Fox News Alert. February's producer price index report just came out six minutes ago, and it shows wholesale inflation is up by 0.6%. From Now, I'm no mathematic mathematician here. I'm no Albert Einstein. I certainly didn't get a degree in math. I actually didn't get a degree in anything, but that's a whole other story. But I'm looking at this number, February producer price index. This tells you how much things cost for people who make stuff in this country. They were estimating that the prices would be up a third of a percentage point, which by the way, again, that's an increase. That's an increase. Things cost more month to month than they did a month ago for the actual producers, the people who buy stuff in bulk to make things, right? Producer price index. So they were already planning on it being up, but instead of 0.3%, it's 0.6%. Now, again, not a math expert, but it looks like it's twice as bad as they estimated. Also, 0.6%, this is one month. Multiply that by 12. You've got over 7% an increase if this trend continues throughout the year. And they're trying to tell you how sunny and rosy things are. January, which is more than expected. And year over year, prices for domestic manufacturers are up one, rather 1 1.6%. That's actual. Which is, again, as you look at this, about 50% higher than they estimated it to be. And they even estimated it to be higher. What does this mean to you? Let's ask CNBC. Our February read on the consumer price index headline number expected to be up four tenths of a percent is up four tenths of a percent. 
Now, if we look at the most recent lower number in this series, we had 0.3 in January, and we had 2.2s in November and December. So this is now a firming issue as we've had back-to-back reads uh, at, at, at Excuse me. We had up four tenths. Now X food and energy also up four tenths, one tenth hotter. So we have back to back on headline and core up four tenths of a percent. Now four tenths equals the look we had last month on core. And the most recent lower number was October. That was up two tenths. That happened to have been the lowest since Feb of 21. So we're firming here. Now the year over year numbers also hotter than expected. 3.2 3.2 on headline year over year. That's 3.2. That would be the highest since Dees when it was 3.4. January remains at 3.1. If we look at year over year core, 3.8. Now, this is interesting. This is one tenth hotter than we were expecting. So let me translate all that for you, if I could, and put it in layman's terms, because I, like you, well, am a layman. Month after month. After month under the Biden presidency, under Bidenomics, which is a word they don't use much anymore, everything costs more. Everything is costing more. Why? Why? If anything, in an efficient economy, when you automate things and use artificial intelligence and actually start streamlining processes, uh, things should be going down, right? Prices should go down. Things are more efficient. Things are, why? Because of government intervention because of the value of the dollar. When you keep spending money you don't have, the only way you can pay it is to print more money because you don't have the money to spend, so you print more money. And as you print more money, then the value of that money is reduced exponentially. And so everything ends up costing more. Also, because this administration puts more restrictions, more rules, more regulations, falsely increasing the cost of labor, and the cost of doing business because of all the extra regulations that are put on. Every time they do a new regulation, corporations have to buy a whole team of lawyers to wade their way through them. That costs more. Who pays for that? The person who buys the product pays for that. That's not because the market has demanded that prices go up because of supply and demand. No, it's an artificial effect on the economy, not under the laws of supply and demand, but under the laws of the government making you spend more because they just decided to make you spend more. That's how inflation happens. And it all happened under Joe Biden. So let's go back to our original clip. Inflation is now lowest of any other country in America. And we granted Joe Biden grace there. We gave him the benefit of the doubt. The best of all possible scenarios is that he just misspoke. So if he just misspoken, what he meant was that things are going great and inflation is the lowest in any country in the world, then he's actually a liar. And so is Queen Jean-Pierre, his press secretary. So let's revisit our premise here. Maybe he's not a liar. Maybe his brain is, in fact, broke. Let's see some other things that President Biden said in this speech and in some other frequent recent appearances. Look, the communities everywhere and at this Boys and Girls Club, by the way, I've been a gigantic supporter of Boys and Girls, just the biggest in the country. But when I was a senator, I provided a lot of money when, during the crime sprees were going on for Boys and Girls Clubs. Do you remember that cartoon character, the dog, the, the, um, what was his name? He mumbled all the time. <laughs> and people would all act like they understand. I'm not talking about Scooby-Doo either. It was another one. <laughs> Every four words, he's doing an impersonation. Is that the stutter again? I I feel like I've got a pretty good working knowledge of what a stutter speech impediment sounds like. That's, a, that's not your classic stutter, but I'm sure that's not the uh, the only. Let, let's see. I am sure he redeemed himself here. There are also cities all across America where highways used to be. Uh, and they, uh, along, you know, redlining, along with redlining, they disconnected entire communities from Okay, let's give him another chance. Tremendous amount of things you can cut. Let me be precise. Tremendous amount of things you can do, not cut. He said, I will, and the bottom line is, he's still at it. (laughs) 
I, okay. All right. Let's 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 extend grace again. Best case scenario, he can't read. Best case scenario, his brain's not broken. He's just illiterate. Or maybe his eyes don't work. And he can't see the teleprompter. And he doesn't have a big functioning, working knowledge of, number one, the English language, and number two, what he's actually supposed to be communicating as president of the United States. You know, Bill Clinton, say what you will about Bill Clinton, and there's plenty to say about Bill Clinton. But famously, in the 90s, he was in the middle of a State of the Union address, and the teleprompter broke. And he was be able he was able to deliver that speech, just like I'm able to deliver this program every day to you, without a teleprompter, without a script, without notes, because he has a good functioning understanding of the topics at hand. This guy doesn't. But, Joe Biden, could you go and speak for 30 minutes in front of this group about the economy? The answer is no, he can't. Donald Trump, yes, also appears with a teleprompter. And we've all seen what happens. The half of his speech ends up being what was written on the teleprompter. The other half is just Trump talking about whatever Trump wants to talk about. This guy is incapable of doing that. All right, all right, one more, one more, because again, I'm, I'm in the mood. It's Lent, it's almost Easter. I wanna be charitable. I wanna extend as much charity as possible for God's sake, right? I don't wanna be led by a lying, incompetent, illiterate moron with a brain that doesn't function, do you? All right, let's give him one more chance here. Last night, in the US Capitol, the same building where our freedoms came under assault on July the 6th. Did something happen on July the 6th that I should know about? First of all, our freedoms did not come under assault on January 6th, so I reject the premise. But all this guy has for his campaign is fear-mongering about January 6th and mega fascists. And if Trump gets in, he's going to throw us all in jail and into the gulags and sh put the Constitution in the shredder. That's all he's got. And he can't even do that. So he's reading. Look at him. You can tell he's reading. So he just saw the word January and his non-functioning brain translated it to July. Well, you know, all those months that start with J are the same. So the economy is terrible. They're constantly lying about it. Uh, the facts about the economy are easy to prove. And the president does not have a functioning brain. Which brings us to uh, my colleague Kurt Schlichter's brilliant column at Town Hall today. Republicans should consider the innovative strategy of not screwing this up. Seriously. I mean, everything is set perfectly for a freaking landslide. All we have to do is not screw it up. I know you already like Kurt's columns, but if you haven't seen today's, get over there at townhall.com and read it. Uh, by the way, the one saving grace here for the Democrats is that if Joe Biden is not capable of reading a teleprompter or speaking in any way without showing that his mashed potato brains don't work, well, they can always trot out Kamala Harris to stump for them. Let's see what Kamala Harris has in mind. And that is not all. If he is reelected, the former president has openly said he intends to weaponize the Department of Justice against his enemies. Oh my gosh, that would be, that. that is, that's an effective talking point right there, seriously. If the American people just knew the dangers of weaponizing the Department of Justice against political enemies, you know, like like the most motivated people who come to Washington, D.C. for a rally in the middle of winter for their candidate. If they were just all rounded up and their doors were busted in with FBI troops, guns drawn, gathering them and throwing them in jail and making them sit and rot for months on end without a fair trial and then putting them away in jail for trumped up charges like parading without a permit or trespassing on the Capitol on an important legislative day, or if the leader of the political opposition was actually facing unprecedented criminal charges right in the middle of a political campaign, 
this would all be very, very horrible and awful. Or what about if the FBI and the Justice Department was weaponized in such a way that they they surreptitiously worked with social media companies to silence and censor people who were expressing political opinions that didn't fit with the president in the White House at that time? That that would be outrageous. That would be incredibly dangerous. If the voters only knew that that was a possibility, they would absolutely vote Joe Biden out of power. Because that's exactly what these people have done. Come on, Republicans, just don't screw this up. Millions of Americans earn and use credit card rewards. I bet you're one of them. I know I am. Corporate megastores want to take those rewards away. Rewards we use on groceries and school supplies, the cash back that you get at the end of the month so you can save on gas or grow a small business. Travel miles that you use to make memories and bring your family together at a time when travel is pretty darn expensive. The Durbin Marshall credit card bill would eliminate credit card rewards. I know it sounds astounding, but this is the kind of thing Congress does. No more travel miles, no more cash back. When lawmakers help corporate mega stores line their pockets, American families are the ones who pay for it. Tell your senator to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com right now to take action. That's handsoffmyrewards.com. So you'll remember Don Lemon in exile from CNN announced a couple of months ago that he was going to start a brand new video streaming show on the X.com platform. Yeah, in fact, Elon Musk was excited about it. He posted about it. And and, and Don Lemon actually sort of joined Tucker Carlson in celebrating this. I think Tucker actually said, hey, welcome aboard, Don, which is hilarious in and of itself. Don Lemon. Uh, it was going to be fantastic, right? And of course, of course, Elon Musk wanted to do this because the site is getting this, um, it's 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 undeserved, but it's getting this reputation of being a bastion of right-wing conspiracies, right? And so, of course, Don Lemon comes up and says, hey, I'd like to do a show here. By the way, this is right after Don Lemon won, like, what, a $24 million out-of-court settlement from his old employer, CNN. It's great when you get fired and then you get a huge payday. How do I get that gig? So Don says, I want to do a show. And Elon Musk says, let's do it, right? All voices are welcome here. I love that. It was going to be great. Now it's not happening. Why? Because Don Lemon just couldn't help being Don Lemon. He posted this statement yesterday. Elon Musk has canceled the partnership I had with X, which they announced as part of their public commitment to amplifying more diverse voices on their platform. He informed me of his decisions hours after an interview I conducted with him on Friday. That interview will remain the premiere episode of The Don Lemon Show on Monday, March 18th. Oh, I can't wait for that. Elon publicly encouraged me to join X with the new show, saying I would have his full support and that his digital town square is for all. He and his team pursued the deal in numerous conversations and made significant commitments about the support X would provide for the show. This sounds like a man who's ready to sue again, doesn't it? Again, I want to remind you, he just sued his former employer, CNN, for over $24 million. Could I just take this letter as well as the out-of-court settlement that he got from CNN as a bit of advice to any other media mogul thinking that it would be a great idea to start something with Don Lemon? Don't do it. What else does this man have to do? It's not enough that his content is crap. It's not enough that he gets no ratings. It's not enough that he ruined CNN primetime, then they moved him to mornings, and he ruined CNN mornings. It's not enough that his coworkers hate him because of his, his horrific behavior in the office. Go ahead and Google it. You'll see how he conducts himself, especially with women. That's interesting. No, none of that is enough. If that's not enough to convince you never to enter into any kind of agreement with Don Lemon, let me give you this last one. It's not going to end well, ever. Even when you have a contract and you decide not to keep him and you fire him, he will still sue you and you will still have to pay. And he will publicly shame you as he's doing right now with Elon Musk. Don Lemon also posted a video about his experience on the uninclusive, misogynistic, racist, and undiverse X platform. 
They, they literally don't know what irony means, I don't think. Here's Don. Hi, everyone. Elon Musk is mad at me. And I just put out a statement about what happened between him, me, and the interview that he is apparently so upset about. But make no mistake about this. This is going to be my first episode of The Don Lemon Show this coming Monday, March 18th. So make sure you tune in. This does not change anything about the show except for my relationship with Elon and X. And there, there's a whole lot that went down and I'm going to tell you about in the coming days. I know, though, that many of you were not happy that I was doing this in the first place. And you told me so. I just want you to know that I did this deal because not only do I believe in free speech, but I believed that this was the best possible chance for the work that I'm doing to reach the largest amount of people. So speaking of free speech, right? I thought the first person interview, no brainer, Elon Musk, the man who calls himself a free speech absolutist. I asked him to do it. He willingly agreed to the interview. Throughout our conversation, I kept reiterating to him that although it was tense at times, I thought it was good for people to see and hear our exchange and that they would learn from our conversation, learn more about him, learn more about me. But apparently free speech absolutism doesn't apply when it comes to questions about him from people like me. What did we talk about? Why is he so upset? Does he even have a reason to be upset? Make sure you watch it on Monday on YouTube and everywhere you listen to podcasts and you can decide for yourself. You can even watch it on X because I'm still going to post it there and I'm sure others will as well. Get off the steps of that church. Uh, that said, clearly this is all a publicity stunt. He did this on purpose. He's just trying to get attention and he's gotten attention. Oh God, we're feeding the beast by giving it attention ourselves. Well, um, sadly, that's part of what we do here. Because people were talking about it, so we should be talking about it. Uh, this entire thing was a setup for Elon Musk. And you can tell by the look on his face here that he saw it coming uh, toward the middle of the interview. I mean, look at that. <laughs> you want that guy staring back at you in the middle of an interview? Uh, you got to love the fact that Don Lemon was so outraged by all of this that he took the video footage and went where? To the company that just, I almost said a bad word, that just fired him. And then he just sued. Oh, my God, this is explosive stuff. Let's go back to the place where everyone hates me. He took it to CNN. If he really wanted people to see it, he should have brought it to Fox or, or here to the town hall or to Tucker or something. So uh, here's what part of the interview contained. Do you believe that X and you have some responsibility to moderate hate speech on the platform? that you wouldn't have to answer these questions from reporters about the Great Replacement Theory as it relates I don't to have to answer these questions. the Great Replacement Theory as it relates to Jewish people. Do you think that? I don't have to answer questions from reporters. Don, the only reason I'm doing this interview is because you're on the X platform and you asked for it. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I would not do interview with this interview. So you don't think, you, do you think that you wouldn't get in trouble or you wouldn't be criticized for these things? I'm or criticized that constantly. I could care less illuminating in so many ways, right? I have two, I have two things I want to ask you about that, Don. First, the great replacement theory, right. as you bring it up, um, you know, he has tweeted, um, a tweet he shared, increasing illegals boost Dem voting power, causing them to recruit more. Mm -hmm. If Dems win president house and Senate, they'll grant citizenship to all legals and America will become a permanent one party, deep socialist state. Uh, let's pause here for a second, because this is critically important to break down here as they're going to take this now. And where where they take this tweet and what they suggest about Elon Musk or you, if you happen to agree with this sentiment, is uh, beyond astounding. But but let's just talk about this for a second. Increasing illegals boosts Democrat voting power. That is objectively speaking true. In fact, Congresswoman from Brooklyn literally said, send us more illegal immigrants because they count them in the census, and that builds the population of their district, their congressional district. You know this, right? I'm sure you do, because you're very smart. You're watching this show. That census counts non-citizens, regardless of their status, legal or illegal, in this country, because it's the population of a district, not whether they're voters, not whether they're citizens, but just the raw population numbers that is used to determine the population of a state and then the breakdown of congressional districts. So if if Democrat dominated states like New York or California or Chicago get increasing numbers of illegals in their state, that actually will increase their representation in the House of Representatives. And I know this because Democrats themselves have said it. 
They've boasted about it. They've bragged about it. They're doing it right before your eyes. That's it. So increasing illegal boost, boost Dem voting power is an objectively true statement. If Dems win President, House, and Senate with enough seats to overcome filibuster, see, enough seats because of designations, because of the redistricting, they'll grant citizenship to all illegals and America will be, well, let's, let's pause there. That's true. They will. If they had a filibuster-proof Senate and if they had a majority in the House and they had the White House, they will, in fact, grant amnesty to every single person in this country illegally. Do you know how I know that? Because Democrats tell me that. Every day, they tell you that. This is what they intend to do. That's what they plan to do. They're the ones who are leading the charge for amnesty for people who are in this country. That's why they don't like you to call them illegal immigrants, right? They're just undocumented. Well, how do you solve the problem of undocumented people? You give them documents. You know, at the risk of being canceled here by promoting the great replacements theory, whatever the hell that is, you need only break down what Elon Musk said here, and you will see that it is true. These are facts. And then finally, America will become a permanent one-party deep socialist state. Well, I'll tell you, if every single policy that the Democrats have put forward in the House of Representatives, from the Green New Deal to revoking the Second Amendment to stacking the court, if all of them were brought to fruition, you bet your ass, we would be, in fact, a one-party socialist state. So now, instead of taking Elon Musk's statement here and doing exactly what I did, but in the reverse, and explain how all of that is a lie and it's false and there's no facts to back it up, instead of doing that, watch what CNN does. Watch what Don Lemon does. Right. He has gone there directly. Uh, how much does he stand by these ideas? Well, he didn't quite seem to understand that he did. Uh, originally, he did that with Jewish people, the sort of a great replacement theory thing that he did with Jewish people. And he got in trouble and he had to go to. Uh... The great replacement theory thing he did with Jewish people. I, you know, listen, sorry, Don, I'm just, you know, a humble talk radio host and a video streamer. So pardon me for lecturing you about journalism, but maybe you should actually show us the facts that what you're talking about here instead of just just randomly throwing out there, you know, as it relates to Jewish people. What are you talking about? You, you have the one tweet all set up as a graphic. Maybe maybe the thing that relates to, you know, Jewish people alluding to the idea that Elon Musk is an anti-Semite, which he is not. Maybe, in fact, you should back that up with some, I don't know, uh, proof. But no, no, you just throw it out there. It's a given fact because this is CNN. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Auschwitz and, and answer questions and, and apologize and go with Ben Shapiro. But um, he doesn't understand that that sort of rhetoric that he talks about, the Great Replacement Theory and, um, and a migrant invasion, that's what radicalized shooters use in their manifestos. Those exact words. The people who go and shoot up people, whether they be Latino people who live in Texas or black people who are in a supermarket uh, in Buffalo or Jewish people who are who are worshiping, those people use the same rhetoric, that they are tropes, that they're either racist for Latinos or black people or for mm -hmm. Jewish people. And I wanted to know if he had, if he felt any responsibility. As someone who has the, one of the largest social media and information platforms in the world. Quarter billion people. A quarter billion people. I think it's 455 or 500 million users a week. And it doesn't seem that he feels that he has any responsibility with that because he seemed really averse to facts. That facts did not matter to him. It didn't matter that he retweeted things that were offensive to people. And this whole, the, the whole idea. Uh, yeah, of all right, it's fine, 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 fine. It, it's, it's, it's so rich to see people sitting on CNN, you know, uh, hemming and hawing about how other news and media entities are averse to facts. Uh, and again, did you see anything there? Did you see anything in that exchange that actually debated the veracity of what Elon Musk said? And say, well, that th this isn't factual. Here's the proof that it's not factual. No, because they can't. 
And and that last thing that he said, you know, that something that's not factual and offensive to people, those two don't always go hand in hand. You can be factual and yet still be offensive to people. And last I checked, you have every right to be offensive to people. But no, these people, they don't want a media outlet like X, a media platform at least, to in some way be offensive to them. To their, because I assure you, when I watch CNN, I'm offended on a regular basis and they couldn't possibly care less about that. And then you did see that one part there where he said, you tweet things out like this, and this is exactly what mass shooters say, mass murderers say in their manifestos. Wow. Ah. So that's the new rule. If, if, if a mass shooter rationalizes their evil act with some quasi political statement that has been also borrowed from another person, then that means that that other person who originally said it is, is guilty by association with the mass murder. Okay. So let's go to the guy who shot up Republicans on a baseball field in Washington, DC Republican Congressman, because he was a regular Rachel Maddow viewer and was inspired by the rhetoric of Bernie Sanders saying that Republicans wanted people to die without health care. Uh, let's go to the guy who shot up people at uh, the Family Research Center uh, and at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, let's go to, oh, how about the Unabomber? The Unabomber's manifesto sounds exactly like any mainstream environmentalist in the green movement in America. Uh, how about the string of mass shootings we've just experienced over the last six to 12 months of transgender individuals who are trying to kill Christians? Is this the game we're going to play now, you odious jerk? Yes, that's the game we're going to play now. A little bit more of the exchange with Elon Musk, Don Lemon. You recently met with Donald Trump in Florida. What did you guys talk about? I was at a breakfast at a friend's place, and Donald Trump came by. That's it. What did you discuss? I've, I've, <laughs> um, let's just say uh, he did most of the talking. Did he ask you for money? He didn't. Are you going to loan him money to help pay his legal bills? I'm not, I'm not paying, any, paying his legal bills in any way, shape, or form. Did he ask you for a donation? No. Are you leaning towards anyone? No. You're not leaning towards anyone? Because you've been very- well, I'm leaning, leaning away from Biden. You're leaning away. <laughs> uh, I do like that little uh, take that with you from Elon Musk. Uh, you know what's most revealing about that clip right there? The grilling, the leaning for Are you going to give Trump money? Did he ask you for money? Do you plan on voting for Donald Trump? It's like, first of all, I would have loved Elon Musk to say, I'm an American citizen, a legal one, and it's none of your freaking business who I'm going to vote for. And would you ask any other person in an interview that question? Because it's rather odious and disgusting. Who you voting for, Don? But secondly, the real crime here is that Don Lemon still likes to pretend that he's the journalist's journalist, the only last pure one left. And he just doesn't follow the news. I knew that Elon Musk wasn't going to give Donald Trump any money. I knew that Donald Trump didn't ask him for any money. Do you know how I knew that? Because Elon Musk said it about 10 days ago. So why does it even have to be asked? But Dad and Lemon, apparently, the newsman doesn't actually follow the news. And so there's a lot of talk right now about the First Amendment. The fact that Don Lemon no longer having a agreement with Elon Musk to do his show on the X platform in some way infringes his First Amendment rights. Now, again, some facts here. I don't believe Elon Musk has deleted Don Lemon's account. I don't think he has kicked him off of the platform. I think that perhaps they were in some discussion for a revenue share deal for whatever revenue was derived from the Don Lemon show on the X platform. And I believe that Elon Musk has basically said, yeah, that deal is off now if this is the kind of show you're going to do. I mean, just to a good tip for any of you up and coming young broadcast journalists, uh, your first interview with the boss who you're trying to make a deal with, you might want to be not be an asshole. Might not end well with your negotiations. But as Don Lemon just said, he's going to be posting this interview on the X platform. 
So there's no censorship here in any way whatsoever by Elon Musk and X. But Don Lemon is saying that Elon Musk no longer believes in free speech. He's just lying to you because he's not coming through with a contract with him to do his show. Well, it's worth looking back in history to what Don Lemon said when Donald Trump was removed from Twitter. Was, uh, people like you and the like carried his water and told lies, allowed the lies to spread. That's why. Senator, nobody asked you to be the editor of the president's Twitter feed, the one he has been permanently barred from, the one he is whining about, about how they've taken away his freedom of speech. The fact is, these are private companies. They have no obligation to have anyone on their platforms. The, these are decisions that have nothing to do with, the, with Congress, except perhaps for people trying to kill them. Think about it, it, it this way. If they're going to espouse freedom of speech, right, being taken away, perhaps this will help you understand if you frame it in that manner, if you frame it in the freedom of religion argument that you use so much. Twitter and Amazon and the like, they are the Christian bakery, okay? Trump is the gay couple who wants a gay wedding cake. First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's what it says. This is nothing about Twitter or social media. The Congress. Don't get it twisted. Stop using that argument. It makes no sense. Don's right about that. It is a stupid argument. Uh, not only does Don Lemon not follow the news, Don Lemon doesn't watch much Don Lemon. Although it actually isn't a stupid argument when you're talking about actually banning someone from Twitter and silencing them, especially when that person is a political figure and a presidential candidate, or at the time that Don, Donald Trump was taken off of Twitter, the actual president of the United States. And the analogy, of course, to the, the baker who doesn't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding is completely, completely distorted because this is a social media platform that can pick and choose what voices are heard Whereas a baker is actually being compelled by the state to create his art against his own personal religious beliefs. It's a completely different scenario here. But, of course, we don't want the facts to get in the way. Uh, yes, you're right, Missouri uh, Dam, Adam, Missouri Adam. He is, in fact, that's he is the one who wanted to force the baker to make that, the cake for the gay couple. That's his own twisted, distorted non-point that he's attempting to make here and not very good at doing it. Um, you know, I got to say, it's good to walk back and look at the old Don Lemon like we just did here and sort of call him out and show him how he's not consistent in a way whatsoever. But we went even further back because I got to tell you something. There once was a Don Lemon that was a pretty good Don Lemon. It was before he got all the social media accolades for being mean to the orange man in the White House. It was before he and Chris Cuomo, who I think he doesn't talk to anymore, uh, did their little stand-up routine. It was before everyone on Instagram and Twitter would say, yes, Queen, every time Don Lemon made some sort of snarky remark, like you just saw in that clip, you know, when he said the thing about the gay baker and then went, Oh, his fans love that sort of thing on social media. Well, before he was given all those accolades, he used to actually come to the table at CNN with some opinions that weren't designed for the woke left social media universe. Let's take a moment and remember that, Don Lemon. Because black people, if you really want to fix the problem, here's just five things that you should think about doing. Here's number five. And if, if, if this doesn't apply to you, if you're not doing this, then it doesn't apply to you. I'm not talking about you. Here's number five. Pull up your pants. Walking around with your ass and your underwear showing is not OK. In fact, it comes from prison when they take away belts from the prisoner so that they can't make a weapon. 
And then it evolved into which role a prisoner would have during male-on-male prison sex. The one with the really low pants is a submissive one. You get my point? Number four now is the N-word. By promoting the use of that word when it's not germane to the conversation, have you ever considered that you may just be perpetuating the stereotype the master intended, acting like a Now number three, respect where you live. Start small by not dropping trash, littering in your own communities. I've lived in several predominantly white neighborhoods in my life. I rarely, if ever, witness people littering. I live in Harlem now, it's an historically black neighborhood. Every single day I see adults and children dropping their trash on the ground when a garbage can is just feet away. Just being honest here. Number two, finish school. You wanna break the cycle of poverty? Stop telling kids they're acting white because they go to school or they speak proper English. A high school dropout makes on average $19,000 a year. A high, a high school graduate makes $28,000 a year. A college graduate makes $51,000 a year. Over the course of a career, a college grad will make nearly a million dollars more than a high school graduate. That's a lot of money. And number one, and probably the most important, just because you can have a baby, it doesn't mean you should, especially without planning for one or getting married first. More than 72% of children in the African-American community are born out of wedlock. That means absent fathers. And the studies show that lack of a male role model is an express train right to prison. And the cycle continues. That's good stuff. It really is. And the sad thing is that that Don Lemon, that Don Lemon saying that stuff today gets canceled. No questions asked. You're done. You're killed. You're canceled. By today's Don Lemon, by the way. Don Lemon himself would cancel that guy today. All right, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is uh, making an announcement later this month. He will actually be saying who his running mate will be for his independent run for the White House. He discussed it on Fox News, and he may have let slip who this person might be. And we know that Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback for the New York Jets, formerly of the Green Bay Packers, is a prominent name in that. Why? Well, he's, you know, he's one of the people that we've talked to. I really like Aaron because, you know, our appeal is to young people. We're trying to make sure that young people are, are, are participating in the political process, that they have hope for America. We want somebody, the people who have run up the $34 trillion debt, which they're dumping on that generation, are all older people. And we want somebody young who's going to look out for that generation. Mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers is battle tested. He's uh, he stood up. He's been hammered by the press, stood up for things we believe. And I like that part of his character. He's a critical thinker. And I think we need that at the time as you know, the rise of AI. We need people who understand that you cannot always trust authority just because somebody's in charge. It doesn't mean that they're telling you the truth. And we want somebody who is going to critically examine. My father used to say, one of the duties of living as a citizen of democracy is to maintain a constant posture of skepticism toward authority. And I think Aaron's shown that. He's also um, somebody who I think will help me get the country healthy again. Yep. He, you know, he's 40 years old. He's focused on his own health. He's very aware of health issues. And, um, and you know, that's what that's one of the things I'm going to that's one of the key parts of my agenda is to get the country help. And we know that Do you uh, catch that there at the end. I think he slipped. He said, Aaron Rodgers will help me get the country healthy again, as if it's done. The decision's made. Fait accompli. Fascinating, actually. Um, and I wonder how the Jets feel about this, too, or even more importantly, Jets fans, as if they haven't been through enough. Let's think this through for a minute, though. Because when I first saw this and I first heard this, I thought, oh, geez, you know what? Up until now, I thought the RFK Jr. candidacy was going to hurt Joe Biden way more than anyone else, that it really wasn't going to affect Donald Trump. If he does pick Aaron Rodgers, that actually could make a dent. Not a big dent, I don't think, but that could make a difference for the Trump campaign. Because I think that there's a lot of young people, especially young men, who really admire and like Aaron Rodgers, and they're probably leaning more toward Trump than toward Biden. And this could actually make a difference 
I really do think that. At least that was my initial instinct until I saw what Jake Tapper and CNN did yesterday to Aaron Rodgers. This report right here is probably the most egregious, irresponsible acts of shoddy, disgusting, tabloid gossip journalism you will ever see. And the fact that they're doing it to Aaron Rodgers on the day that it appeared RFK Jr. had made his decision and it was going to be Aaron Rodgers. The fact that they're doing this to try to spike Aaron Rodgers tells me that the powers that be in the Biden White House and the Biden campaign, they put up the flare and they told their friends in the media, Aaron Rodgers has to be destroyed. That tells me that they think Aaron Rodgers was going to hurt them more than Trump. Watch. In 2013, when CNN's Pamela Brown was covering the Kentucky Derby, she was introduced to Rogers, hearing that she was a journalist at CNN. Rogers began attacking the news media for, quote, covering up important stories. Rogers then brought up the Sandy Hook shooting and said the news media was intentionally ignoring that the shooting wasn't real, that it was a government inside job. I remind you, the shooting, of course, was very real, very tragic. Twenty children and six adults were murdered that day. When Pamela Brown asked Aaron Rodgers for evidence of what he was talking about, Rodgers then began sharing various theories that have been disproven numerous times by evidence. Rodgers falsely claimed to Pamela Brown that there were men in black in the woods by the school, and he asked if she thought that was odd. Brown says that she found the entire encounter disturbing. Yeah, I find that report disturbing. Jake Tapper, just like Don Lemon, considers himself the last real tell-it-like-it-is truth teller in Washington, D.C. He's doing the real journalism. Just look how serious he is. I mean, just look at him. Look at how serious he knows that he is. So let's just unpack this story, shall we? A fellow CNN colleague, Pamela Brown, who doesn't appear on camera or actually respond to any questions about this report during this segment, claims that over a decade ago, Aaron Rodgers at the Kentucky Derby started saying things about a Sandy Hook conspiracy theories. And she hasn't said anything about it until right now. In fact, over the last two years, what's the one thing people have said about Aaron Rodgers? They said that he's been wrapping himself up in COVID-19 vaccine conspiracy theories, right? That's the word that they would use. Oh, he's a vaccine conspiracist. Don't you think that as the media was lining up to tear down Aaron Rodgers over conspiracy theories about the vaccine, that would have been the perfect time to bring out this story? He also believed these conspiracy theories, but of course he didn't. Also, side note, the conspiracy theories that he believes about uh, the vaccines, funny how those conspiracies turned out to be true. Also, Aaron Rodgers, over the last year, he did a one-on-one -on -one interview with Bill Maher, and in it, he was very critical of Donald Trump. He talked about Donald Trump in the 2020 presidential campaign, and I, I'm paraphrasing him, he said something like, you know, it, it reaches a point where you got to stop complaining about the last election, man up, accept the loss, and move on. You know, when he said that and he was critical of Donald Trump, Jake Tapper didn't put the red siren out there and br deliver breaking news about what a uncredible and unbelievable person Aaron Rodgers is, right? Because at that time, he served the media's purpose. He served Jake Tapper's purpose. Now, as a potential running mate to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. that could hurt the Democrats and Joe Biden, now he's a, a problem. Now he needs to be dealt with. Now we need to line everybody up to destroy him. It sort of calls into question how true this story is, especially given the fact that Jake Tapper's history in bringing breaking news to his viewers involves the very first major story about the Russian collusion dossier. The reason that the mainstream media started reporting on the, the fake steel dossier that included Donald Trump allegedly going to Moscow and having prostitutes, forgive me, urinate on a bed in a hotel room. The reason we all know about that story is because Jake Tapper, award-winning journalist, decided that it was newsworthy. And of course, it was a lie. It was a lie. So forgive me for being a little skeptical about the Aaron Rodgers Sandy Hook story. 
By the way, Kyle Becker, who does some great forensic work on the internet, he actually uncovered a video of what Aaron Rodgers actually did say about the Sandy Hook shooting. But from lawmakers to celebrities, the whole country really is talking about the people and what happened in Newtown. Yeah, and Aaron Rodgers is getting in on that as well today. He shares what he hopes will come from this tragedy. I hope that we can learn from this and look for the signs more and, and not ever have something like this happen and, and keep this on our minds because these are things that um, affect all of us directly or indirectly. And um, this needs to be something that we learn from. There you go. Like a like a good Berkeley graduate. He wrapped himself up in the whole shooting thing, and I'm sure that he called for gun control. So I guess he will be a good running mate for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But that's actually what he said after the shooting at Sandy Hook. But uh, it's interesting. It's interesting now that to consider looking at how the left wing media, the corporate media is lining up against Aaron Rodgers and the idea that he could be a running mate. It's interesting now to consider if this really is a real thing and whether Aaron Rodgers will be the running mate and what that will mean to the presidential campaign and the dynamic here. He recently appeared on Joe Rogan's show, and he had quite a bit to say about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. FK was trying to do that. Yeah. Silver standard. Yeah. Guess what they did to him? Mm. Yeah. 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 (laughs) You see Bobby Kennedy out there. They won't even give him Secret Secret Service Service protection, which is just egregious it's so wild they won't give him see he's the only presidential candidate ever it's been denied secret service protection three times i think already. yeah yeah it's just they're so corrupt yeah and they're so in your face with it and no one does anything about it you had bobby on the on the podcast yes i did yeah what'd you think of him i love him yeah i, lo- I love look looking if forget about the vaccine stuff which uh like i think he's got very good points about all that stuff it's there's real data and if you read his book Oh. If you read the real Anthony Fauci, you would be sick to your stomach if you know the absolute truth. If sick. it wasn't truth, wasn't he'd truth, sued. he'd be sued. Yeah, he's not getting sued for a f-ing reason. Um, but just that alone. But then if you forget about the vaccine stuff, you just look at his environmental record. What he did when he was an environmental attorney, when he was suing these so companies, the they were yeah. yeah. I mean, he yeah. fought, they cleaned up the Hudson River because of him. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. I love. I really love him. And the things that he's been saying about what what happened during the pandemic. You know, he, he had some talk that he did recently, some uh, speech, some uh, conversation he did recently that was public, where he was talking about this is we're being poisoned by food. And this is why everybody got so sick from COVID. The disparity between people who got COVID and it was just a cold versus people who got COVID and they were deadly ill is 100 percent what they're eating and what that does to their body and how it compromises their immune system and how it causes comorbidities like diabetes, type 2 diabetes and obesity. It's not exactly that simple. And this is my issue with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and sometimes with Joe Rogan as well. Uh, no, uh, people weren't getting comorbidities because of what they ate. They were getting comorbidities because how much of it they ate, <laughs> to be honest, and how little exercise they got. Obesity was definitely directed to it. But the solution from people like this will be, you know, no more corporate farming and no more, you know, uh, uh, various developments in farming and agriculture that have actually helped feed starving people over the last 10 years that that would have starved before all of the innovations in agriculture. So uh, let, let's just stick a pin in this for a second here, because uh, I know that people get excited about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. because he says things that we might believe in, but he is a radical left-wing Democrat. Let's not forget, he wanted to run for the Democrat nomination for a reason. That's what he is. He's a Democrat. And no, he's not a genius when it comes to the climate. He's a radical. He thinks the carbon dioxide is a pollutant. He wants to shut down corporations. I don't want him anywhere near the White House unless it's for some event commemorating the assassination of his uncle. Then he can be a guest at the White House, but I certainly don't want him working there. And I think that it's worth noting that the idea of an Aaron Rodgers, Robert F. Kennedy ticket could, in fact, actually be a huge disruptor in this presidential campaign. And my worry here is that this guy, Joe Rogan, and the people who listen to his show and watch his show, I think they are natural Trump voters, especially if the choice is a binary one between Trump and Biden. And if they are given another lane to go, I'm afraid they might take it. And maybe that will help Biden. It's certainly something to watch. But I will tell you this, if the idea of Aaron Rodgers running with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is so 
upsetting to Jake Tapper that he would deliver that kind of despicable report, sliming the man through hearsay? Well, maybe it's a good thing. Do you ever wonder why your elected representatives who claim that they're going to do a ton of stuff when they get into office, either in D.C. or in your state capitol, once they get there, suddenly they become like they've been attacked by the pod people and they end up doing things that are completely opposite of what they said they were going to do and they no longer represent you anymore. They represent special interests. And then they try to tell you how great they are. You ever wonder why that happens? Because it seems to happen a lot. Well, there was a debate in the South Carolina State House that really shed some light on this whole thing. Adam Morgan is a Republican in South Carolina, and they were debating a issue that had to do with, I think, a development, rezoning, empowerment zones, all these big government ideas about how best to grow the economy in certain areas. But you see, it's always the government choosing the winners and losers. And then, of course, years later, you find out that uh, some of these politicians and people who are part of the permanent bureaucracy, they end up benefiting directly from these new developments, right? They had a family member or a friend who happened to know a guy who was part of the construction company or the real estate company, or you know how these things go. And it's all legal. Why? Right? Right? How is it legal? Because the actual lawmakers who decide what's legal and what's not legal, they give themselves loopholes on all these things. It happens all the time. And rarely do you see a state delegate like Adam Morgan engage in a conversation with a Democrat. A Democrat's name, when you see him, is Todd Rutherford. Rarely do you see this kind of exchange happen in real time that shows it all in plain view. But boy, oh boy, does this not prove everything, everything that we already know. Watch. The pressure in here in Colombia is for me to not even vote red on the board. Y'all might not know this. A a dark money entity that was created on Tuesday, the day after we voted for this, I went home and a a attack piece went out in my whole district about the fact that I voted for this. I get that the people in Colombia, that the lobby wants me to either not vote or to vote green on this, but my constituents want me to vote red and they want their tax money spent on core government functions on their roads on their schools that's what they want their money spent on they don't want us in here trying to play this government planning thing where we and our bureaus can figure out where the job should be who should be employed how much money should be allocated where in the private sector it never works it's socialism it's never worked anywhere before so what are we doing to trying to do it here but wait would you consider the fact that south carolina's track record on bringing major projects into this state is has a winning record and therefore again commerce should be listened to rather than those people back in your district that may not have ever brokered a deal may not understand what it means of being a project may not understand economic incentives so what your suggestion is we should listen to the people back home (laughs) in your district rather than the people at Commerce that have been successful at bringing these mega deals to South Carolina. Mr. Rutherford, I don't think that you could have espoused a philosophy that disagrees more fundamentally uh, than me. I I completely disagree with you, and I I think that you believe what you just said. But no, I 100% am going to listen to the people back home who I represent in this house, and you should listen to the 40,000 people in your, uh, your area and not and not the bureaucrats at Commerce, and not the lobbyists, and not the multi-billion dollar international corporations. You should listen to your constituents like I am. So yes, I will always fall back on the common sense of the wonderful people from Taylor's and Greenville Eastside far more than I will ever listen to unelected bureaucrats, other representatives in here who have been here for far too long and have maybe managed a whole lot of these deals, and far more than I will ever listen to any member out there. So Mr. Boom. Boom. I, I got, God bless Mr. Rutherford, the Democrat, for saying the quiet part out loud. Well, I mean, are you telling me that we should listen to the idiots in our district, the people that we're actually supposed to be representing? They don't know what the hell they're talking about. They don't know anything about, about economic incentives. They're not as smart as the permanent bureaucracy in the Commerce Department who's recommending we do this. Come on. 
Those idiots, those idiots, all they're good for is voting for us. Period. That's the only usefulness they bring to the table. What kind, what kind of moron are you that you're actually going to, what's the word, represent the people who voted for you and sent you here? I mean, that's beautiful. And actually, again, sadly, this issue is happening all across the country in our houses of representation, but it's never actually talked about out loud. Very rarely do you have an Adam Morgan step up and say, my God, what the hell are we doing here, people? Well, you know, more money is to be made. So what? The people of my district don't want it. You know, and here's the thing. they what, he's, he's 100% right that they'll spend money on this economic growth and the tax breaks and the incentives and the corporate, and, and they'll be able to play. They'll say, well, look, we built this mall and look at all the commerce and look at the jobs and look at all the good things. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Good for you. And as you're driving to get to that job or you're driving to get to the mall to spend money on overpriced crap that you don't need, your road is full of potholes. And you might get carjacked on the way, or you might have a, a, an accident. You need to call an ambulance. Or you might get mugged at the mall and you need a police officer and there's just not enough resources for that sort of thing. We can't fix the roads. We can't hire more cops. We can't hire more, more ambulances and, and emergency workers to care for you if you've got a problem. No, because we give all the tax incentives so that we can build the mall so that the economy can grow. I mean, <laughs> that's literally what happens. Uh, Keeg 79, uh, his name is Adam Morgan. He is a state representative down in South Carolina, although I think he's got a bid for Congress right now. Uh, and Boomer Sooner, by the way. I'm married to a Boomer. I mean, I'm married to a Sooner. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's a beautiful smoking gun moment. And it made to order. I mean, it's like it was scripted, seriously. The fact... And and you know the other aspect of this, it's, it's great that Adam Morgan is there and he had the perfect response and it was a great delivery and I loved it. And this, there's a reason why this video is going viral right now. But what Rutherford did there, it I just said it was like scripted. The, he delivered a statement. I want to play him again because honestly, he's the most important part of this. I want to play him again because if you wanted to write dialogue of an out of touch, almost evil elected official who has nothing but contempt and disdain for the moronic idiot yokels who live in their districts that are just used up like, you know, wasted tissue paper to send you so that you can wear your fancy suits and do important things in your state legislation, uh, state house of legislature. This guy is made to order like from Hollywood. And what he said here, it's the most informative part of the whole thing beyond the pushback from Representative Morgan. Watch. Wait, would you consider the fact that South Carolina's track record on bringing major projects into this state is, has a winning record and therefore, again, commerce should be listened to rather than those people back in your district that may oh, not have oh, ever brokered a oh. deal, may not understand Ooh. what it means of being a project, may not understand economic oh. incentives. So what your suggestion is, we should listen to the people back home yeah. in your district rather than the people at Commerce that have been successful at bringing these mega deals to South Carolina. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what we're suggesting. You elitist scum. Yes. It is a constitutional republic, and we make decisions through elected representatives. And what does a representative do? Represent the people, the interests, and the ideas of the people who put them into office. And this is a plague, not just in South Carolina, not just in other states in this country, and certainly not just in Washington, D.C., but even over in Ireland, they're feeling that. Watch this. This is this is just a salty old guy who likes to go to his pub with his very thick Irish baroque. This is a, a special video that we want to share right before St. Patrick's Day because the good people of the Emerald Isle, my ancestors, there's lots of O'Connors there, although not as many as you'd think. O'Connor's not nearly as popular an Irish name in Ireland as it is here in America. <laughs> They are dealing with the exact same thing. And watch this man stand up at his local pub at a town meeting 
and express exactly the same sentiment about how he and his family and his community are no longer being represented. And the people in his parliament care more about brand new foreigners who have come into this country than the actual people who live in his town. The person that owns it, that has, property has been sold over and over again. And this man here, who's a reporter with News Talk and, and the local media, he cannot find out, and the local, the local auctioneer here cannot find out who is the registered owner of that, that property. There was an advertisement put in the papers some time ago uh, asking for expressions of interest for people who would be prepared to do what's coming up now. I'm totally opposed to those houses going up. Those, they're not houses. They're costing 144000 being manufactured somewhere else. Since we opened up in 2017, we have got no return at all. Most of the food and the services that are brought into the Iraq Centre and every place else is from outside, as far as Mullingar. So we have got no benefit in this town at all, despite the fact that we have probably six or seven hundred non-Irish people living in the town. They are welcome to the town, but we have got nothing in return. We have no employment. The meat factory we had was knocked down and it's just gone back to agricultural land again. Nobody speaks on our behalf. We have no government representative in Balladrine. The, the TDs that we have in this county are not government TDs. So what more can you expect to be just more and more dumped on top of us? So enough is enough here tonight. And I hope that uh, if there is a committee formed, that the first thing will be to stop these 47 houses. Now, the county managers had been directed from the government, some agency in the government, to ascertain where could they put 600 and something refugees, Ukrainian refugees. And it is Ukrainian refugees we'll be getting in those houses up there. I'm an elderly person, I'm 80 years of age, and I meet every day elderly people who are looking for houses and they cannot get them. Yeah. There are people beside me here that have been turned down over and over again. We must look after our own people. And it's about time to look after our own when a uh, representative government stops representing the people who empower the government, it doesn't end well. And you see this tide now worldwide in these countries that, that have governments very similar to ours, many of them modeled off of ours. You see this happening more and more and more where a few people at the top are deciding certain things that the people don't actually want, but the people at the top are saying, well, you don't know what you're talking about. We know what's good for you. We know what's best. Shut your mouth, keep paying your taxes, or we'll throw you in jail, and leave the tough decisions to us, your betters. This doesn't end well. How do I know? Remember that old uh, meme from a year ago, how men daily think about the Holy Roman Empire the Ro or, or ancient Rome? It's kind of true. We can learn a lot by looking at ancient Rome. You, you think you think things are okay when you've just got a few people at the top who are making decisions and, and you sell the populace on the idea that you've got some form of republic, you've got some form of representation, you've got your Senate. Hey, the senators are there, they're on your they're there making decisions for you. What, what more do you want, citizens? Eh, the Senate's fine. Yeah. You think that ends well? Eh, we'll open up a book and read about Rome. In fact, one of the policies that best exemplifies the failure of representatives actually doing the will of the citizenry, of the voters, of the people, is the entire movement toward defunding the police. We saw this in 2020. You know, Black Lives Matter famously embraced Marxist ideas. Uh, they wanted the destruction of the basic family unit because they said that that was a uh, uh, part of the patriarchy and part of a capitalist, uh, old world kind of thought process. They're Marxists. The people who founded Black Lives Matter are self-confessed uh, uh, Marxists. And the people who embraced the entire defund the police movement, reimagine law enforcement, reimagine policing, reallocate funds for the police in other social welfare avenues. They were all Marxists. 
And now we hear we're three and a half, four years after that movement. And it's good to sort of check in to see how things are going. We'll start in Toronto, where like the rest of the major cities in North America, they are run by left wing liberals in Canada. It's actually literally the liberal party. And they were infected by the Black Lives Matter movement and the defund the police movement. You'd think that what happened to George Floyd in Minnesota was something that happened, you know, in downtown Montreal or something. And of course, because of the new social systems that they put in place and the defund the police, reimagine law enforcement policies they put in place, shockingly, Toronto now sees a huge spike in criminal behavior, including home invasions. Armed home invasions where people are breaking in, threatening the homeowners at gunpoint, and stealing their car keys so that they can go and steal their car and drive off. So, in Toronto, the cops have a solution. Car thefts have become more prominent across the GTA, up nearly 25% in 2023 from the year prior. Now, police in York Region are out with a new safety tactic. Hold on. Uh, because I know where this is going and I know what the punchline is. I'm sorry. I know that I interrupt the videos uh, early on sometimes, but this is important. As you watch, as you watch this video and you watch what law enforcement and elected officials are advising the citizens of the greater Toronto area, the GTA, about how they uh, should protect themselves. Look at the Chiron there. New auto theft prevention tactics. Ah, we're going to learn how to prevent auto theft, right? Here's your new auto theft prevention tactic. Okay, let's watch what it is. Door stops have been handed out to some residents in an effort to prevent door kick break-ins to steal car keys. It's a move that has one Unionville family feeling uneasy. So it's gotten to the point where they're actually just handing these things out to uh, residents. That's, to me, shows that it's very high risk. I'm not sure if the whole street got it, um, but when I was talking to my parents about it, they said that they were handing it out to the houses that back up onto the park because they're more of a high risk area. Ali Galinsky says her family received the door stops along with installation instructions last week, just days after police went door to door in her neighborhood, handing out pamphlets on auto theft prevention. It gives you some tips like investing in a alarm system and security cameras, install motion sensor lights, keep your windows and doors locked, trim trees and shrubbery so there are clear views from the street, um, and don't post vacation plans or luxury purchases on social media. The move is part of York Regional Police's ongoing efforts to slow skyrocketing car thefts in the region, an effort which includes community engagement and education. Community services was involved and created uh, pamphlets and Faraday bags, as you've seen, uh, those have been dispersed through uh, our community partners. There's also updated advice for all vehicle owners. A message echoed by Toronto Police speaking at an Etobicoke safety meeting last month. Constable Marco Ricciardi had a new message for vehicle owners who keep their fobs in Faraday pouches. To prevent the possibility of being attacked in your home, leave your fobs at your front door. Because they're breaking into your home to steal your car. They're, they don't want anything else. A lot of them that they're arresting have guns on them and they're not toy guns. They're real guns. They're loaded. That's why Galinsky says they will be installing the door stops and taking YPR's advice seriously. But she'd like more action from police as well. She'd like more action from police. Yeah, that would be nice. Get, did you catch that? Leave your keys by the door. Because they're breaking into your house to steal your car. So so just leave them there. So it's easier to steal your car. That's the auto theft prevention tactic. I mean, why not just leave the keys right on the hood of your car? In fact, why not just leave your car unlocked with the keys in the ignition? Then, then you won't have to get a new door. And I do like I do like that the cop is saying, you know, they're armed, they've got guns, and they're not toy guns. You know, here in America, we have a Second Amendment right. They don't have that in Canada. In fact, I'm sure you've engaged in conversations with your Canadian friends who were just aghast at the gun violence in America. And it's like, that's why we have gun laws in Canada. You know, there's, there's no private ownership of guns in Canada. But I'll tell you this. 
if the community of York, which is a tony little suburb outside of Toronto, if uh, they had, think this through for a minute. If York was the only city in all of Canada where homeowners were allowed to have guns in their possession and they were able to use them if someone were trying to break into their home. Let's just let's just think this through for a minute. Anyone in Canada watching this, I want you to play along with this game with me because I think it's going to be really educational. If the community of York is having a run of car thefts and, and house break-ins, right? So if the city of York decided, you know what, we are now going to legalize gun ownership only in the city of York. And every single person who lives in York has the right to own a gun and if someone's breaking into your house, you have the right to use that gun to protect your home. Do you think the number of home break-ins in York would increase or decrease? It's a simple question. Put your answer in the comments. I'm curious. I know what I think would happen. But no, no, the real solution is we'll give you a doorstop so it's harder to break in your door. But if they do make it past the doorstop, just leave your keys right there. So they'll just take the keys and leave. So that's Toronto. And it, by the way, echoes what Washington, D.C., right here in your nation's capital. We're so proud to be broadcasting from there. What they did recently, because, you know, carjackings in D.C. are up a ton. It is the carjacking capital of the country. And so the mayor of D.C., Muriel Bowser, she... Uh, really wanted to address this problem. Today, we announced a pilot program to provide D.C. residents with free digital tracking tags for their vehicles. Now, of course, that doesn't prevent a carjacking, but it's really helpful for when your car gets carjacked, you'll be able to find it eventually and go retrieve it. So, you know, thanks. You know, while you're at it, while you're at this pilot program giving away free digital tracking tags, I've got another idea. Maybe you should hire more cops and arrest the carjackers and then put them away in jail for 10 years. Now, if you did that, once again, we'll play the game. Do you think carjackings would increase or decrease if you actually sent a clear message that carjackers would be arrested and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law? Because right now, they're barely arrested. And if they are arrested, they're out on bail within hours. Oh, and here's a great thing about D.C. You got to love Washington. If you do have one of those air tags and you are able to track your car down after it's been carjacked, well, you're going to find it in an impound lot and you're going to have to pay thousands of dollars to get your car back. It has been five months since Michelle Terrell's SUV was carjacked. But now my MPD coming in to get my car. It is finally back in her possession. I really feel great because... These people told me it couldn't be done. Well, this is the happiest I've been in a while. Seven News first talked to her back in November after robbers held her husband at gunpoint and stole their car in Northwest D.C. She says police recovered it two months later in a nearby apartment complex. But she says she didn't find that out until a month after that because the impound notice was sent to an old address. By the time she knew to go pick up her car, the fees had piled up. I really think it's very unfair if you already became a victim to have to come out of your pocket or have to struggle to figure it out. And it that's right. Look at that. Fourteen hundred dollars. Fourteen seventy was the fees and the towing expense and the impounding fee. And here's a woman, a victim. Her husband was robbed at gar gunpoint and the car was jacked. They finally recovered the car. It's impounded. And she's got to pay fifteen hundred bucks to get her car back. And that's Washington, D.C. That's a higher fine than I bet the carjacker will have to pay if they're ever arrested. How's that defunding the police thing working out? How's that reimagining law enforcement thing working out for you? Oh, but that's just Washington, D.C. That's crazy. It won't happen in a normal middle American town. Oh, yeah? How are things going in Pittsburgh right now? Here's Pittsburgh's new policing plan. Rick. What was the big takeaway today? Yeah, Susan, residents of the city will see a major change in the way police respond. They will no longer respond to calls that aren't considered in-progress emergency. 
That means calls like criminal mischief, theft, harassment, and most burglary alarms will all be handled by an enhanced telephone reporting unit. That means residents will file a police report over the phone. Officers will not respond unless it's an emergency. Also, between the hours of 3 a.m. and 7 a.m., there will be no officers at any of the six stations throughout the city. Call boxes that link directly to 911 have been installed for people to use in case of an emergency. And during the overnight shift, there will be as few as 20 officers to cover the entire city. The chief said today the data supports that. Yes, it's enough to cover the entire city in, in those hours when we have 8 percent of the time people are calling. I'm confident in the decisions that we make that it impacts this bureau and the city in a much better way than we have in the past. Now, the chief also acknowledging today that some of these changes are due to staffing shortages. He's down to 740 officers, well below the 850 they would like to have. Now, coming up new at five, residents, city council and the police union all weighing in on these big changes that begin Monday. Uh, I love we're playing this whole, you know, uh, guessing game here and uh, kind of, you know, will, will carjackings go up or down? Will the home weekends go up or down? One last question. A little contest here. The political party, the political affiliation of the mayor of Pittsburgh. What do you think? Republican or Democrat? It's a tough one. That's Pittsburgh. You want to report a theft? Leave a message. And we're going to shut down all of the police stations citywide in the middle of the night. If you need police, uh, you'll go to 911 and we'll decide if it's worthy of sending somebody out or not. Everything's going to be fine. And, and so, so as a result of this, let's play our game one more time. I lied. It's not just the Democrat Party affiliation. Oh, I gave away the answer. Spoiler alert. He's a Democrat. Ed Gaines. Uh, all right, one more. As a result of these new reforms in Pittsburgh with the police department, will crime go up or will crime go down? Will people be victimized more or less? The police have announced that they will not be manning their police stations with any personnel every night from, what was it, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m.? Is that what the hours were? So during those hours, do you think there will be more crime or less crime? You know what? With the economy the way that it is, with the president's brain broken, with crime as bad as it is, and Democrats having solutions like this that actually empower the criminals and further victimize the citizens, with the border in crisis, with national security completely twisted into beyond recognition, I return you back to my colleague Kurt Schlichter's article today at townhall.com. Republicans, please, could you could you do whatever you can do to find it in yourself to not screw this election up because it's right there for you on a silver freaking platter. Let's just all you need to do is not screw it up. That is it for today. I appreciate you watching. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, like, share, subscribe. Uh, leave a rating, leave a review over at the audio podcast at Apple or at uh, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. We would appreciate that, especially at Apple. It helps increase the visibility of everything we're doing, and it seems like you like what we're doing. And in the meantime, we'll see you next time. I'm Larry O'Connor. Please just call me Larry. <laughs>